Hello and welcome uh, everyone to our webinar today on Sackett versus Environmental Protection Agency and the future of Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Uh, my name is Jonathan Adler. Um, I am among other things, director of the Coleman P. Burke Center for Environmental Law here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Uh, the Burke Center is hosting uh, today's program. Uh, and the center was launched in 2019 uh, with a generous gift from our late alumnus, uh, Coley Burke, uh, who among other things was a prominent uh, and very devoted conservationist. And the center among other things, uh, sponsors programs like this. Uh, you can find archives of our other programs uh, on our website, uh, as well as providing scholarships for students interested in studying environmental law and um, uh, research on environmental law related subjects. Um, for those of you that are here for the CLE credit, um, CLE information will, will be provided at the end of the program. Um, uh, I know this is approved, at least in Ohio, for uh, one hour of CLE and can often be used in other states that accept uh, online CLE programming. Today, I'm really excited uh, to be able to host this program on the first case of the Supreme Court term that begins next month. And, and it's an environmental case. And it is uh, I think uh, likely going to be a significant environmental law case uh, concerning the Clean Water Act, um, Sackett versus Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, this was the first case that will be heard on uh, Monday morning, October 3rd. And in this case, the court is being asked to clarify the scope of federal regulatory jurisdiction uh, under the Clean Water Act, uh, and in particular, whether or not um, the Ninth Circuit or lower courts have been applying uh, the proper test in determining whether or not wetlands are subject to regulation uh, under the Clean Water Act, or at least under what conditions uh, wetlands on particular parcels are subject to regulation under the Clean Water Act. Uh, this is a question, uh, as we will discuss, that the Supreme Court has addressed before. Um, it's been a subject of regulatory proposals by each of the last three uh, presidential administrations, has been the subject of extensive litigation and political controversy, uh, and is certainly of particular importance in terms of the implementation and enforcement of the Clean Water Act. And as we will talk about, um, this is not the Sackett's first uh, time before the Supreme Court in their fight with federal regulatory agencies. Uh, and um, they were at the Supreme Court before 10 years ago uh, when they received a unanimous uh, uh, victory in a case concerning whether or not uh, they could challenge an administrative compliance order under the Clean Water Act. Um, 10 years later, they are, are, are back before the court. Uh, with me to discuss this case, uh, the issues involved, the implications of what the court might do, uh, I'm joined by Royal Gardner, who's professor of law and co-director of the Institute for Biodiversity Law and Policy at the Stetson University College of Law. Uh, so welcome, Roy. And, and I'm also joined by Jonathan Wood, who is vice president for law and policy at the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, John, welcome to you. And, uh, I should note both of our uh, participants today um, submitted amicus briefs uh, in this case, um, uh, one in support of the petitioners, one in support of the respondents. Um, links to their, or their briefs are uh, available on uh, the website for this webinar. Uh, certainly check those out um, uh, as they present important points related to this case. Um, uh, also, you know, both of our participants have much more extensive bios, but uh, for, for efficiency's purposes, you can refer to their bios on the website, uh, but it'd be worth our time getting into uh, the details of the program. Um, so I guess just to start, uh, you know, in order to, to understand this case, why it's important, why it matters uh, for environmental protection uh, uh, and for the operation of federal regulatory programs, we need to unpack some of the legal issues that the court is going to be wrestling with, um, and in particular, as it relates to um, this phrase, waters of the United States, or, or sometimes you may hear people say WOTUS. Um, so this is another case where WOTUS is at SCOTUS, and we could, we could go on with, with that sort of pun. Uh, but to, to start with you, Roy, could you just uh, give folks an idea of the significance of the phrase waters of the United States? Um, why does the definition of this phrase matter uh, for the Clean Water Act and, and federal regulatory programs? Sure, and and first, uh, thanks, Jonathan, for for inviting me to participate. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, 
uh, waters of the United States or, or WOTUS matters because it's at the heart of the Clean Water Act. It, it defines the waters that are federally protected under that law. So the Clean Water Act starts off with a prohibition that, uh, that, that prohibits the point source discharge of pollutants into navigable waters. Congress defined navigable waters to be waters of the United States, which is broader than traditional navigable waters, waters that are, that are used in commerce. Um, it's broader because otherwise Congress just would have used the term navigable waters. But there's ambiguity about just how broad are these waters of the United States? To what extent does it cover wetlands? And as, as Jonathan Wood's uh, amicus brief on behalf of PERC noted, wetlands provide ecosystem services, benefits to people flood control, uh, water, water quality functions, habitat for, for commercially important species. So if wetlands are not protected, we lose those wetlands, we lose those benefits. So that's why the definition of WOTUS and its scope is so important. That, thank you for that. Um, John, turning to you, can you give, give folks a, a sense of kind of how the federal government has defined waters of the uni United States in the past? I mean, this is, is has there just been one definition or or has this been something of a moving target? Uh, well, that may be the easiest question today. No, uh, there's not been one consistent definition. Um, initially, the EPA and Army Corps interpreted the Clean Water Act quite narrowly. Um, Congress had a long history of regulating navigable waters. The agencies initially said this, we're going to interpret the reach of the Clean Water Act. Similarly, there's a case uh, very quickly after the act was enacted brought by the National Resources Defense Council challenging that narrow interpretation. And the district of uh, district court for the district of columbia agreed with nrdc to say that no this is something bigger than what congress has tried to do before congress is trying to go according to that court to the full extent of its commerce clause power to regulate to protect water quality so based on that interpretation which agencies acquiesce to they adopted regulations that largely governed the statute throughout the 80s and 90s um and pretty broad authority so it's not just all waters that are could be used for for navigation, but also all waters, the use or damage of which could affect interstate commerce. You followed conflicts over the meaning of the Commerce Clause power. You can imagine how quickly that, that expands. Um, and then all tributaries of those waters, all wetlands that are adjacent to any of the, the categories of water. So you can get these really long chains under that interpretation, uh, uh, asserting um, authority quite a bit um, upstream of what were traditionally understood to be navigable waters. Okay, great. And then this, this as I mentioned in the introduction, this has been litigated before. Um, uh, Roy, could you give us an idea of what what this, what is the Supreme Court said to, told us about waters of the United States? What what that definition either does or does not include? Yeah. So the court has weighed in on multiple occasions. Uh, the first was in 1985 in Riverside Bayview Homes that involved wetlands that were adjacent to a traditional navigable water. And the Supreme Court rejected the lower court's attempt to require a regular surface water connection flooding from the uh, navigable water to the wetland. And instead, uh, under Chevron, the court deferred to the agency's interpretation concluding it was reasonable for the court to assert jurisdiction over these wetlands that were adjacent to navigable waters, regardless of the surface water connection because of the wetlands water quality functions. 16 years later, court revisited the issue, but this time dealing with uh, so-called isolated waters uh, in, the, in the case of Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County, also referred to as SWANK. So this involved, uh, ponds uh, where the Corps of Engineers was asserting jurisdiction based on the presence of migratory birds. Here, the Supreme Court said, well, look, in Riverside Bayview Homes, it was the si significant nexus between the wetland and the navigable water that informed our reading of the statute. Here, there's no significant nexus. And um, there are fed federalism concerns because we're getting close to uh, the outer most uh, uh, reaches of Congress's power. This is an area that's traditionally left to the states. And so we're not gonna defer to the core. Then we get to Rapanos in 2006. And this dealt with the waters in between 
the 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 uh, uh, adjacent wetlands to a traditional level of water and and isolated uh, ponds. It dealt with non-navigable tributaries and wetlands adjacent to those non-navigable tributaries. And here the court split uh, four 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 one. Uh, the four dissenters would have applied Chevron and deferred to the agency. Uh, Justice Scalia wrote for the plurality, uh, and he came up with a rather restrictive definition of, of WOTUS, which will be very important when we get to talking about Sackett. And he said, uh, the only plausible definition of waters of the United States are those relatively permanent standing or continuously flowing bodies of water. And wetlands are only jurisdictional if they are adjacent to those waters of the United States. And there's a continuous surface connection such that you can't tell. It's difficult to tell where the wetland ends and the other water begins. But that only got four votes. In the middle was Justice Kennedy, who, who thought, that's eh, Justice Stevens, too broad. Justice Scalia, too narrow. Justice Kennedy went with the significant nexus test, whether the wetland has a significant nexus to a traditional navigable water. He voted along with the, the plurality to send it back down to the lower courts to, uh, to consider. So the big takeaway from Rapanos was no majority opinion. So, I mean, that this you know, creates a situation which comes up in, in lots of contexts. We've seen it in other areas of law. Uh, the court decides a case, there is a judgment of the court, but no single opinion captures a, a majority of the justices. And so th there is not a lot of clarity about what rules should be uh, applied below. Um, so John, what, what, have, what have lower courts done? I mean, what, what have they done to deal with the fact that you have um, four justices on one side, four on the other, and, and one kind of in the Goldilocks uh, middle position here, um, uh, but adopting a test that the eight others reject? Uh, yeah, they've largely gone with Goldilocks. Um, so the, the standard that courts are supposed to apply comes from a case called Marx. And the test is which position uh, is the narrowest grounds um, for which there was someone supporting the judgment. But that's a difficult to apply in a case like Rapanos, which is trying to identify the outer reaches of a statute. Is the narrowest grounds the narrowest interpretation, the narrowest interpretation of the limits on, on federal jurisdiction? And how do you weigh the four dissenting justices and whether they might have a preference between uh, the opinion supporting the judgment? Um, this was largely cleared up by guidance from EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, which took the position that the agency could rely on either test to find jurisdiction. Um, so essentially, the test that controls is whichever one enables the agency to prevail. Um, but in practice, most of the conflict has been over the application of the Kennedy concurrence, and that's that's what most courts have followed. So the theory, I guess, there is that that for folks is that is that you had four justices that would find jurisdiction very broadly, and that insofar as there are uh, wetlands that would satisfy the Justice uh, Kennedy test, um, there would be five votes to find jurisdiction. If there are waters, and I guess there's some question about whether or not. This, this, we see much of this in the real world that would satisfy the Scalia continuous um, uh, or regular uh, surface connection uh, test, but would somehow not have a substantial or not have a significant nexus, that there would be eight votes for jurisdiction there. Um, and again, as, as noted, there is some, um, some, de some debate, uh, lengthy law review articles about how one should think about Marx in that sort of situation. Um, John, we had you mentioned that there was initially a guidance um, explaining kind of what the how the agencies were going to approach this in terms of making jurisdictional determinations, making enforcement decisions. Um, we eventually get regulations years later. Um, uh, can you kind of briefly tell us about what the Obama and Trump administration um, tried to do in their respective regulations? That's right. It takes about a decade before the agencies really want to try to solve this problem through the regulation. So in 2015, the Obama administration um, issued a WOTUS rule, uh, which I think is widely perceived as trying to reclaim some of the regulatory jurisdiction that were lost under Swank and Rapanos, um, using a scientific connectivity report and a general policy view that 
broader federal regulation, federal regulation is more consistent with the water quality goals of the Clean Water Act. It adopted a pretty expansive definition of tributaries and adjacency, kind of claiming authority over any features within the floodplain of, of waters and tributaries, um, and also set distance requirements. So it's a pretty broad uh, definition. It was largely sold on clarity grounds. The idea was you don't like the significant nexus test. It's really hard to apply. So we're going to take a lot of cases that might have been jurisdictional and make them clearly jurisdictional, um, which do, is clarity in a sense, but didn't, certainly did not satisfy the, uh, uh, the regulated community, which quickly sued over the definition, um, which was enjoined uh, as even, exceeding even Justice Kennedy's opinion um, and was ultimately blocked for implementation in 28 states. Uh, which got you to an election and a new administration, which had very different views on the Clean Water Act. One of the early actions by the Trump administration was an executive order directing EPA and the Corps to revisit this question. Uh, they took a two-stage process. First, they eliminated the Obama rule and then started work on a replacement. So in the interim, you would have the pre-2015, we've got these 80 regulation, 80s regulations modified by, by Rapanos governing things. Um, and then in, in 2019, the, the Trump rule came out, which did largely move in the direction of the Scalia test, narrow federal jurisdiction, and particularly got rid of the idea that ephemeral streams, those that don't, aren't relatively permanent, um, don't qualify, and they got rid of distance tests. That, too, was immediately litigated, as you can imagine, um, but because of the timing when the rule came out, the defense of the rule um, ultimately um, fell to the, the Biden administration, which signaled early on to the courts that they were going to revisit the question. So instead of having all this litigation, they asked the court to instead remand the issue. Um, the court ultimately went beyond that and remanded the issue while also vacating the opinion, a, a controversial practice. But essentially, you had in a relatively short period of time, two efforts uh, by the agency to resolve this question, both of which very quickly got hung up in the courts. And one thing you mentioned that I think is worth flagging for people um, that that maybe contrasts some things that are going on here with what went on with uh, under the Clean Air Act with West Virginia versus EPA. In the West Virginia case, uh, the Trump administration had rescinded the Clean Power Plan and adopted the ACE rule in, in effect in one move. Right? The, the, the Trump administration adopted a particular interpretation of the Clean Air Act that it argued compelled both the rescission of the Clean Power Plan and the adoption of the ACE rule so that reversing that interpretation of the Clean Air Act would have an effect on both of those. Here, though, it's interesting to note that that Trump administration took a different uh, approach of um, uh, rescinding WOTUS and then adopting um, NWPS, its own, the, the Navigable Waters Protection uh, Rule, um, uh, separately, um, which from the standpoint of administrative litigation is is the sort of little thing that that can sometimes be significant. Um, Roy, can you so so what's the Biden administration's policy now? Like, what are they? Uh, because this case, you know, like West Virginia versus EPA, comes against the background of different administrations wanting to adopt different policies, kind of you know, ping ponging back and forth every four years. What is the Biden administration's current policy? Presumably, a policy that will be affected or could be affected by what the court decides to do here. Yeah, so, so when the when the, the the Trump rule, the Navigable Waters Protection Rule was vacated, um, it was not clear, at least it was not clear to me, whether the vacature was nationwide, applied to the Ninth Circuit, just in the District of Arizona, but the Biden administration treated it as a nationwide vacature and went back to the pre-2015 regime that uh, that Jonathan was talking about. So basically the 1980s regulations plus the post Rapanos guidance. And then the, uh, the Biden administration started a new rulemaking. And so a proposed rule was published in the Federal Register in, uh, in December of 2021, received more than 114,000 comments. The comment period closed in February. And uh, we're waiting for the final rule to be issued, unclear when that might occur. Uh, essentially, the proposed rule um, codifies the, the, uh, the pre-2015 regime. So it, it, it's the old regulations, but updated with respect to, to take into account some of the language from Rapanos, both, uh, both from the Scalia and Kennedy opinions. 
And and just to, to clarify, because I want us to turn to the details of the set, the set case in particular, a new uh, a new final rule would not reach retroactively to affect the sackets, or it would. So if the buy if if the buy if 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 I mean presumably the Supreme Court or we can we can hold that question. That is worth. I mean, my, my assumption was that that. The, they're challenging a decision that was made under the prior regulations, and so that's how their their uh, uh, their challenge is, is to be evaluated. I mean, is this a race against the clock sort of situation? I guess is I guess my question. Not necessarily. I mean, because because uh, the. Yeah, we can get into that a little bit later. I mean, the court the court didn't need to take this case, um, and and so, uh, but clearly the court wants to uh, uh, to weigh in and and uh, clarify what it views as uh, what Congress meant by waters of the United States, and so it, the court may not be deferring to what uh, the executive branch is doing here. So certainly, what the one thing that is clear is what the court decides could. Um, define the outer bounds of what the Biden administration can do in a new rule. Uh, and that that certainly is one reason why this the case is significant for the rulemaking that the Biden administration is is, is going through. I, I should note, folks, too, we're starting to get questions in the Q&A box. Um, so for those that are um, that, that are viewing, um, if you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A box. We will get to the questions. Um, uh, so please, you know, when they occur, you go ahead and, and put them in. Um, so I want to turn to, to the Sacketts. As I mentioned before, Michael and Chantel Sackett have been to the Supreme Court before. Um, they have um, uh, been, I guess, trying to uh, legally develop this particular parcel uh, near Priest Lake um, for, for quite some time now. Um, can you give it, to tell us a little bit about you know what what the what the facts are what what's going on in this case why why does the definition of the waters of waters of the united states matter to them yeah uh, big question uh so the sackets in 2004 purchased a two-third acre lot uh near priest lake idaho um it is in a largely but not completely built out residential area um so the basic lay of the land is it's bordered by streets on two sides many of the surrounding some parcels have homes um, in 2007 they began work on building a home that's the, the reason why they purchased the parcel um, and so like lots of development they started by putting down sand and gravel to provide a place to put the foundation for the house um, shortly after the sand and gravel was put in place epa agents directed their construction crew to stop and followed up with the administrative compliance order saying they violated the Clean Water Act because there had been wetlands on the property that they had fit, illegally filled, and the order demanded that they restore the site or face penalties that accrue at a rate of $75,000 per day. Now, the dispute over jurisdiction um, is based on the relationship between the property and a wetland across the street from the property. The Sackets dispute jurisdiction because from their perspective, there are no water features on the property, and there's no physical connection from any previous wetlands to uh, to any regulated water. Uh, as I said, it's bounded by a road on both sides and there's there's homes built out in the area, um, including a row of houses that separate this lot from Priest Lake, which is a, a navigable water. EPA, on the other hand, says there is jurisdiction because the parcel used to contain a wetland that was part of a bigger wetland across the street, uh, which is drained by a man-made ditch, which connects to a stream, which is a tributary to Priest Lake. And therefore, because of that series of connections, um, that's enough for a significant nexus. Uh, what it means for the Sackets, uh, a couple things. One, in theory, they could be punished for their past action in 2007 to place sand and gravel on the property. Um, the Clean Water Act imposes both criminal and civil, civil pen penalties to anyone that fills a regulated water without um, a permit. Uh, second, the, the value of their land would almost certainly decline if subject to um, federal regulation. The cost to acquire a permit is something that people would take into account when deciding whether or not to, to purchase this property. Uh, and third, the record indicates that the EPA would never approve a permit, that it's not eligible for nationwide permits because of the type of wetland at issue under the regional interpretation, and that EPA has said that since the Sackett's own other properties in the general area, that if they wanted to build a home, they're gonna to have to go there in this land and could be developed. 
Um, so it really does affect the, the future use and um, opportunities on this parcel. Okay, so so they, um, uh, you know, they're concerned because it affects their ability to do with the property what they were hoping uh, to do with it. Um, Roy, so they, they made their claim to, they took their claim to court, right, claiming that, oh, you know, this, this, our parcel is not part of waters of the United States, you know, the waters are across the road, what have you. Um, what did the lower courts do? Well, uh, it, it, they, first they, 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 they had a pre-enforcement challenge, uh, until they went up to the U.S. Supreme Court and won that. Uh, so the Sacketts actually prevailed once in the U.S. Supreme Court already. Uh, so then it's come back down. And at that point, the EPA was like, all right, hey, we withdraw our compliance order. Uh, we're done here. Let's, uh, let's move along. Uh, but the, the Sacketts said, no, we don't think the case is over. Uh, and, and the Ninth Circuit uh, said that, yeah, it's not moot. Uh, the case is not moot because a new administration could come in or uh, the EPA could change its mind and reinstate or reissue the compliance order. Uh, so then the court took a look at uh, the merits to say, OK, is this a jurisdictional wetland under the Clean Water Act? And relying on the Marx analysis that uh, that was discussed earlier, uh, the Ninth Circuit said that the controlling test for this is Justice Kennedy's significant nexus test, and that EPA had properly concluded that the wetlands on Sackett's properly, property were jurisdictional. So at that point, uh, the, the Sacketts then petitioned uh, the Supreme Court for cert, uh, asking the Supreme Court to uh, revisit Rapanos and to adopt Justice Scalia's plurality opinion. Uh, the Supreme Court granted cert, uh, but reframed the issue, uh, 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 the question presented slightly uh, to whether the Ninth Circuit set forth the proper test for determining whether wetlands are jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. And just really quickly on that point, I mean, you know, lot, you know, there are there are lots of folks who spend lots of time trying to, you know, read the signs of what the Supreme Court is is telling us. Presumably, the justices had a reason for rephrasing the the question presented. I mean, is there much we can draw from that, or, or is there is you know, if you were to 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 interpret that, is there a particular signal you think they were sending, or or does that indicate what the court is is focused on? I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I you know, on the one hand, you could you could say, well, maybe they maybe they phrased it that way because they they wanted the parties to address the Marx issue, but nobody went in that direction. On the other hand, you could say, well, no, they wanted to really tee it up and say, is the significant nexus test really the appropriate test uh, for wetlands? So it certainly seems they broadened it, made, made the question less technical, um, gave them more, a broader range of options to state that you know, there's, there's a broader range of things the court yeah. they theoretically could do without departing the or, or going beyond the bounds of the way the question is phrased. I mean, that's the way that that um, I saw it. Uh, John, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but also if you could, you know, what, what are the seconds, what is, what, is, what is their ultimate legal argument? What are they asking the court to do um, you know, what is, what are we likely to hear at oral argument in terms of the case they're making? Mm -hmm. My speculation for why the court changed the question is the original phrasing teed up a Marx issue, and I doubt the court wanted to be bombarded with briefs analyzing Marx and Rapanos and said, broadened it, what we want to decide the substantive issue. Uh, whether that speculation is right or not, the Sacketts definitely seem to have interpreted something similar from the change. So initially, um, the Sacketts were asking the Supreme Court to adopt the Scalia plural plurality interpretation of the Clean Water Act from Rapanos. Um, in their merits briefing after the case was granted, they have tweaked that slightly. They're offering a test that is informed by, by the plurality opinion, but not exactly. Uh, they, they suggest it should be a two-part test. One um, is the uh, wetland physically connected to a water, as that term is normally understood, so a stream, lake, river, um, and then is that water of the United States, meaning it's part of a channel of commerce that is within uh, Congress's channel of interstate commerce authority. Um, what, what's interesting is that is where all of the focus 
in all the briefing has been on, been, which which makes sense, but there's been relatively less question on exactly what the Ninth Circuit did here. So it might be helpful, I think, to to lay out exactly how the Ninth Circuit saw the test. Um, and as I read the opinion, they the Ninth Circuit says a wetland is jurisdictional if quote, it either alone or in combination with similarly situated lands in the region significantly affect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of other covered waters more readily understood as navigable. So it's a word salad of, of vague standards and, and I think explains why the court reached out and took this case, notwithstanding the Biden administration developments. So Roy, the, the federal government obviously is contesting um, the Sackett's position. I don't like the, the Sackett's proposed test. What is the, the federal government's view of, of what the court should should do in this case? Yeah, the, the federal government is actually um, uh, has a has a slightly dif different view of the facts um, that the Sackett's wetland is actually hydrologically connected to the fen and to the lake by a shallow subsurface flow. Uh, and so the, the government is arguing that it's jurisdictional under the significant nexus test that this is an adjacent wetland. It is similar to Riverside Bayview Homes. And thus, there's no basis for imposing a rigid continuous surface connection requirement. That is one of the things that the Sackets is requesting. Um, instead, the court should defer to the agency's interpretation of the Clean Water Act to cover adjacent wetlands. And uh, the court should not reach the question of tributaries uh, and just focus on, on wetlands. Interestingly, uh, the US government brief did not have any mention of Marx. Uh, and there was only a single fleeting reference to Chevron that happened to be embedded in a citation to Riverside Bayview Homes. That, that's interesting, because because presumably one, one way we could think that a court would deal with this, maybe not the current court, but maybe a prior Supreme Court would be to say, waters of the United States um, is at least somewhat ambiguous and uh, interpreting that phrase is something that uh, an administrative agency could do in the exercise of its, uh, not only of its judgment, but also informed by the agency's uh, scientific and other expertise. Uh, and that's not, uh, and certainly in Rapanos, there's a lot of discussion about um, the, the extent of de uh, deference the agency should get. Um, but it is interesting that, that we don't see that here. And that, that continues a, a trend. Um, the Supreme Court has not favorably cited Chevron in a decision since 2016, um, or not in a majority opinion, I should say. Um, and um, I guess it sounds like the federal government is has has taken a message from that and is not trying to rely upon Chevron uh, to make its case. Roy, based on your read of the, the government's briefs, um, if the court were to adopt something similar to the Scalia plurality in Rapanos, would the Sackets necessarily uh, prevail, that is to say, if one accepted the government's view of the facts, but the, the Scalia view of the Clean Water Act, would the Sackett's land be subject to regulation as waters or, or not? Or is that hard to tell? Well, I think, I think if, if the court adopts um, a Scalia type approach uh, or something similar to what the Sackets are advocating, then there's no continuous surface connection and it, and it wouldn't qualify as a water of the US. Right. So that subsurface connection while significant hydrologically perhaps, not a surface connection and the Scalia opinion in Rapanos and the Trump administration uh, rule placed a lot of weight on connections being being surface connections. And, and for folks that, that aren't, don't spend a lot of time with the Clean Water Act, as a general matter, groundwater is not subject to regulation, direct regulation under the Clean Water Act. There are obviously contexts in which what happens in groundwater matters. The Maui case from a couple of years ago is an example of that. Um, but we spend a lot of time talking about surface versus surface waters versus groundwaters in ways that may or may not make sense scientifically, but um, seem to make sense legally, um, or, or some folks think makes sense legally. Um, John, there, there are, this case has gotten a lot of attention. Um, I think I counted 28 amicus briefs, including yours, on the side of the Sackets. So um, business groups, property rights groups, uh, anti-regulatory groups um, uh, have clearly see this as this case is a big deal. Um, why? Uh, what, 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 what is so important about this one landowner's uh, effort to um, escape 
the, the, the scope of federal regulation? Yeah, the, so the answer is that the Clean Water Act covers a lot of territory. There are a lot of folks that have been in similar situations or could imagine themselves in similar situations. Uh, so you're right, there are 28 amicus briefs representing 27 states, industry associations, property rights, free market groups, like a really broad coalition. I couldn't summarize all of the arguments uh, in those briefs, but there are a couple of key points. One is strong federalism arguments that Congress recognized. There's a role for the federal government. There's a role for the states. And if federal jurisdiction under Clean Water Act is too broad, you creep, you, you intrude on, on the state authority. Um, there are also arguments about uh, the cost and uncertainty that the regulated industries have faced over the past few decades. Um, as the, the rules have subsequently changed, Congress has not tried to clarify what what does the United States means? Courts haven't provided much meaningful guidance. Um, and then a lot of other groups have raised concerns about the scope of agency power. So are there non-delegation or deference problems inherent in a case like this? Um, you mentioned FERC filed amicus brief uh, supporting Sackett. We took a slightly different approach from, from those. We, um, we were concerned in large part because what distinguishes wetlands from traditional navigable waters is that wetlands tend to be on private land. Most navigable waters are owned by the state. They're public trust issues there, like they're, they're a separate category. Um, and so when you're regulating federal land, the incentives that you're creating for, or in, when you're regulating private land, the incentives that you're creating for those private landowners really matter. Um, the Clean Water Act, if jurisdiction applies in situations like this, makes the presence of a wetland a liability for the landowner. Um, and if the EPA doesn't have the resources to be out there policing every single one of these wetlands on private land, uh, the concern is that landowners may preemptively harm wetlands or at least not do things to maintain and, and restore them. Um, so our brief looks at some of the challenges that people have faced when trying to, to maintain and conserve wetlands and the alternative ways that exist to provide more stronger positive incentives for wetland conservation restoration. Uh, and then on the one very quick point too is that what's interesting is there are also industry groups on the other side supporting EPA. Um, and some of their arguments, I think, are relevant to, to this discussion. So there's one uh, expressing concern um, that the current test is not clear enough in a problem, but the Sackett's test is also bad or maybe worse. So there's sort of no good solution, just a lot of bad outcomes. And there's a separate amicus brief from water utilities saying their concern is that they have a lot of exemptions in the Clean Water Act they benefit from. If federal jurisdiction shrinks, states may impose more restrictive uh, regulation. So they're actually looking, this is, they prefer federal regulation over more robust environmental protection at the state level. Interesting. Uh, Roy, you also uh, uh, filed a brief um, on behalf of scientific organizations. Um, I was wondering if you could could tell us a little bit about that brief and then, you know, some of the arguments and, and concerns that are being uh, raised by environmental organizations about what, what the implications of this case could be should the court uh, uh, scale back the scope of federal regulatory jurisdiction. Yeah, our brief was filed on behalf of 12 scientific societies. Uh, we wanted to uh, inform the court about the importance of considering science when making these decisions. Uh, one of the, the scientific pieces that's important is that um, it really doesn't make any sense to make a distinction between a wetland that is connected by surface water or a wetland that is connected by groundwater to a uh, to another surface water, um, the the wetland still performs similar functions. <clears throat> um, we also we used a, a a model that was developed by uh, St. Mary's University, which was also introduced in some of the rulemakings, uh, that identified what the scope of the reduction would be if there was a continuous. Uh, surface water connection requirement. And it, it, this is actually, it, it's a minimum estimate in terms of the reduction because it doesn't necessarily take into account those areas that are cut off by roads, for example. Uh, and so depending on the watershed, you would be looking at a reduction of Clean Water Act jurisdiction over wetlands by 20 to 50%, if just if the continuous surface connection requirement was imposed. There's that other piece that nobody's really talking about. And this was in this was in Rapanos, and it's also in in the Sackett's brief, which is you have to have the continuous surface connection so much so that it's difficult to tell where the wetland ends and the other water begins. It is always easy to tell. It's the extent of the wetland vegetation. Uh, 
So that if that part of the test were adopted, essentially that wipes out all almost all regulation of, of wetlands at the at the federal level. Uh, you can <laughs> wetland delineations make a distinction between the wetland and streams. Uh, permit applications do. The mitigation requirements that the Corps of Engineers imposes makes a distinction between wetland mitigation, stream mitigation. So the distinction can be done. Um, you can almost always tell where the wetland ends and the other water begins. So if that's the rule, not, not much left in terms of, uh, of, of, of uh, federal protection of wetlands under the Clean Water Act. So, and so, so that, that, that the scope of federal regu regulation could be dramatically, uh, dramatically affected. We have a bunch of questions in the queue, and I, I want, I want to get to those. Um, I do did have a question. I didn't, you know, a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court had another big Clean Water Act case, um, uh, uh, County of Maui versus Hawaii uh, Wildlife Federation. Uh, there, the def the question wasn't what's a water of the United States, but what's a discharge from a point source. Um, Kind of oversimplified, an oversimplified kind of summary of that case. You had um, uh, sewage treatment plant. Uh, there was groundwater injection and uh, seepage that it was ultimately reaching, um, uh, reaching uh, the ocean, and so reaching uh, waters, jurisdictional waters. And the court there, uh, I think, surprised a lot of people by um, uh, adopting what is a somewhat broad understanding of what a discharge. Uh, from a point source is. So, so one question is whether or not either of you thinks we could see um, an outcome, you know, a surprising outcome like that where the court uh, adopts a broader um, view of federal regulation than anticipated. Um, uh, and then I guess somewhat relatedly, um, do, do either of you have thoughts on how what the court does here will interact with what the court did in Maui in the sense of, um, you know, Maui seems to be more focused on um, the discharge of pollutants that eventually make their way to waters, uh, whereas this perhaps is more concerned about where it is the initial discharge occurs. Uh, at least that might be one way of looking at it. So I don't know if either of you wants to, wants to, to, to pick up with, with how does Maui relate to this? Ron, happy to let you go first. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'd be delighted if the court took a, a similar a, approach uh, because really the, the Maui case developed uh, science-based factors in terms of what constitutes a functional equivalent of a, of a direct discharge. So to the extent that the court's going to take science into account, yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be happy with that. Um, I'd also be happy uh, with the way that the court in Maui took into account the overall objective of the Clean Water Act to avoid reaching an absurd result. Um, now, with respect to the, the functional equivalent test itself, uh, you know, that could be, could be relevant if somebody's discharging chemicals into a wetland that reaches a surface water. Um, but uh, if you're looking at it from a 404 uh, program perspective, I think it's largely irrelevant because uh, the point for fill, which is fill is a pollutant. Uh, it eliminates the water body. Um, so the, the purpose of the fill is not to migrate, it's to, to be in place. So uh, I think it would be unlikely, there could be situations, uh, but I think it would be unlikely where the discharge of dredged or fill material into a wetland uh, would trigger a permit requirement under Maui. But just yeah, I, I think it's a really key point. The way I would put it is Maui County changes the stakes of Sackett, uh, that even if federal jurisdiction over waters were to decrease, you could still see authority over traditional pollutants upstream of regulated waters, even though they're not directly into it, um, which is why a lot of the briefing on the Sackett doesn't talk about, talk, talk much about traditional pollutants, which you normally would think would be the, the most scary potential outcome. Instead, this really is about ordinary land use activities happening on, on wetlands on private land. But, but the thing to keep in mind is that WOTUS applies to all of the programs under the Clean Water Act, not just the 404 program. But is, but is it fair to say that, you know, let's say hypothetically the, the court gives the Sackets what they want um, it, uh, and determ adopts a test that results in their parcel not being part of waters of the United States. 
is it fair to say that a consequence of that would be they could deposit fill on that land as much as they want, but were they to pour toxic sludge on uh, or, or some particular chem chemical onto their land and it reached Priest Lake, that they could arguably still be prosecuted uh, for uh, discharging a pollutant without a permit because the discharge uh, ultimately reached Priest Lake. Is that a, is that a is that a plausible scenario? If 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 the Sackets prevail on the the question about their whether their land is part of the waters of the United States, I think so, and I think that's the right way to think about the issue generally. The one potential complexity in the Sackets case is that the subsurface water connection doesn't flow that direction. It flows from the bigger wetland across the street to the Sackets property. So you'd have to think about what the mechanism would be for that pollutant to reach the water. But Maui County definitely opens up the possibility for capturing that kind of activity, even if you wouldn't cover fill. But presumably, I mean, so that would be the sort of thing that I guess that, that if, if someone wasn't willing to settle with the agency would have to be proven um, in, in the context of an enforcement action, which presumably is more costly for the agency, right? Whereas, you know, showing that someone dumped fill on, on, a, pro on a property relatively easy to show, showing that whatever chemical substance was deposited on the property reached uh, a, a, a navigable water would be more, more costly, more time intensive, um, require a greater showing by the agency. Um, and so that would certainly have an effect, I, I presume, on, on um, uh, the sorts of actions that they would, or the number, volume of actions, number of actions that they would take. Um, so we have a bunch of questions in the in in, in the box. One one question that that I, you both have touched on a little bit um, is um, you know what what should the court make about um, uh, the underground aspects of wetlands? The fact that wetlands um, themselves may um, uh, be at least in part underground. The the, the hydro, uh, hydro hydrophilic vegetation may be underground. The, some of the hydrological aspects of the parcel you know maybe underground and certainly the connections are underground, but yet when we think of navigable waters, we certainly think of surface waters and there seems to be this, you know, this longstanding idea that the Clean Water Act is about surface waters. How do we, how should the court think about that tension between kind of the hydrological connections on the one hand and the traditional emphasis on surface waters? I don't think they're inconsistent. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the wetland is is a surface water, um, and and the the goal of the Clean Water Act is to protect the the nation's waters, um, to you know, with a focus on traditional navigable waters, but broader than that. And the wetlands have a connection to these traditional navigable waters, whether it is um, through uh, surface connections or through groundwater connections. And the Supreme Court already dealt with this in Riverside Bayview Homes back in the 80s. And it was unanimous to, set, to, to, to recognize that Congress acknowledged that, that when you're trying to protect these uh, navigable waters, that it's an aquatic ecosystem. So you have to take a broader approach if you want to actually accomplish the overall objective. John, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I'm not sure the Supreme Court is going to see that as a problem either, um, in part because I think there's a difference. So I, I highly commend Royal's amicus brief to everybody, which I think does a really good job of presenting how a hydrologist or wetland ecologist would think through these questions. And I also appreciate their pictures of exactly the type of Places they're concerned about, which I think is always a good idea in a, a case like this. But I think the court is going to look at this not from the perspective of a scientific expert, but the average landowner. Like one of the things that makes the Clean Water Act unique from, like, say, the Endangered Species Act, which requires an agency scientific determination to trigger requirements, is that the Clean Water Act imposes on the individual landowner the obligation to figure out what's regulated and how to avoid liability. Um, and so I think the court's not going to not going to necessarily take subsurface complex hydrology into account because the average landowner who could be facing civil or criminal penalties isn't necessarily going to understand how to do that. Is in that respect, I mean, for if folks look back at the first Sackett opinion, there was a, a concurrence by Justice Alito um, uh, that really highlights 
um, the, the plight of the landowner. If one look, goes back to Justice Scalia's opinion in Rapanos, there's a lengthy intro that talks about wetlands regulation from the perspective of the regulated. So, you know, if in terms, there's at least some indication that some of the justices in this context are particularly concerned about the landowner. For myself, I've I've written that it's probably not a surprise that in these sorts of cases the court tends to like cases with small landowners. Right? They they, they did not accept cert from some major developer. Uh, or from some big, um, uh, you know, resource uh, using company, um, but from uh, a couple that they had seen before, um, and you know that might be the court tipping its hand about how it how it see, how it's going to approach. Um, right. Let me, let me let me let me let me gently push back on the notion that people are being criminally prosecuted for unintentionally filling wetlands that they had no idea about. That just doesn't. That doesn't happen. The very few criminal prosecutions that take place is where you have uh, knowing flagrant violations, as was the, the case in Rapanos, where, you know, he was told by his, you know, he was he was told by his expert, you got wetlands, apply for a permit. He was told by the state, you got wetlands, apply for a permit. He was told by the feds, you got wetlands, apply for the permit. And he didn't. Or is this, was not uh, a poster child. Of, no, uh, I'd, I'd, of, I'd, I'd of, say take a look at what? take a look at the how the 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 dissent frames those uh, frames those facts. Right. Um, uh, a question, I guess, that's I directed at you um, from one of our uh, colleagues in academia. Um, uh, the question is that 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 the outset you suggested that that waters of the United States provides a broader navigability test than the general test for commerce regulation, but the constitutional authority for the for the Clean Water Act is premised on the Commerce Clause. So how could it be broader than what the Constitution provides for? So it's not broader than what the Constitution provides for. So so uh, the federal government, Congress can can regulate the, the, the channels of interstate commerce, which those are your navigable waters. Uh, can regulate instrumentalities in interstate commerce, but it can also regulate activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. So it's the the third piece, which is which uh, which is pretty pretty darn broad. Um, and you know, you go back and look at Wickard v. Filburn, which of course is the outermost reaches of of uh, of of the commerce clause, but that was actually reaffirmed in in Gonzalez versus Rach, uh, so, so, not, but, not too long ago. But a good way to think about it then is that is that is that if if, if the navigable waters themselves are the regulation essentially of commerce and the channels of commerce, that regulation of wetlands and other things that are intertwined with uh, uh, those navigable waters hydrologically is because they they substantial uh, the substantial effects on interstate commerce. Yeah. because of the effects on channels. Um, John, any thoughts on that, or, or, I mean, do we think the court's going to say much about the constitutional background in, in, in Swank? There is a very brief discussion of constitutional avoidance, where right? we can't let the Army Corps of Engineers regulate this isolated water because that would push the boundaries of, of, of federal power, and so we're going to adopt a narrower interpretation. Um, Justice Kennedy essentially tips his hat to that again in, in Rapanos. Um, uh, do we think we're, there's going to be much discussion of that in this case, or is it going to be focusing on the statute? Possibly. The seconds have certainly teed it up. The second part of their test is very much about whether the commerce question, whether Congress is trying to regulate the channels of commerce versus the substantial effects, the much broader commerce clause power. My read is that the court's probably going to be more inclined to go with the Rapanos priority test, which doesn't necessarily depend on trying to resolve that question. That's based on the fact that you have three justices that are holdovers from Rapanos. They all supported the plurality. Kavanaugh filed an opinion in Maui County basically endorsing the, the plurality test. So you, you've already got pretty, pretty strong signals that you can get to a majority for that test. And I think the concern would be is if the court tried to go further, is it going to produce another Rapanos situation where you have a plurality and then a bunch of concurrences, but no clear resolution? Can the court um, I mean, there's a question in, in, in the queue about um, statutory stare decisis. You know, as a general matter, you know, we know on, when it comes to constitutional questions, 
there is an argument the court has to be willing to reconsider precedents because that's the only way you can correct mistakes. In the statutory context, we typically say, well, Congress can change. You know, Congress might not be inclined to, but Congress certainly can change statutes. And um, is is the is the issue here that because there was no majority opinion in Rapanos, there is no opinion that is subject to stare decisis? Uh, I don't know if either of you have thoughts about about how how we should or the court could or should think about that aspect of the question. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 oh, go ahead, Roy. I, well, I, 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 I'd look at, I'd look at Riverside Bayview Homes, and 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 say, there's there's where the court made a statutory determination. Um, you know whether this this particular court feels bound by uh, by stare decisis in any context. Different, yeah, I'm, yeah obviously not. Yeah, and I, what I would say is I don't think any of the past decisions constrain very much. So Riverside Bayview is about a wetlands complex that was immediately connected to a navigable water. It wasn't this longer chain of um, tributaries that led to a wetland that was separated by a road. Um, so there, there's that relatively narrow, courts have said this is okay. And then there's the other extreme case on the other side of an isolated pond, um, can't be regulated. But that leaves a wide variety of outcomes. And if there was a Rapanos majority, maybe there'd be some constraint. But otherwise, I think the court has quite a bit of room within those two bounds. All right. Well, we're getting very close to to the bottom of the hour. Um, so I want to kind of get the, the the final the final thoughts from each of you. And John, starting with you, um, what should the court do, and what do you think it will do? Well, I've already signaled, I think the court will at the very least go with the Rapanos priority test based on, on past cases and past votes. Um, I think the most important outcome here is a clear test uh, that, that the average landowner could, um, could implement, because that's what's going to allow for divisional labor between the federal government, states, and the private conservation community. Um, the, the current regime where the rules change wildly every four years isn't serving anyone well. Like you can't conserve a wetland for four years, destroy it, and then go back to conserving it. Um, so I think the most important outcome here is to have some sort of certainty that sends that signal to the different parties about what their role needs to be. And, and how optimistic are you that whatever decision the court reaches will provide that degree of certainty? Yeah, I mean, compared to the status quo, I think the plurality opinion would be much more certain, and that's where I think the court's likely to go. There will certainly be questions, because that's that's what we do as lawyers. We find ways to, to find the, the gray area in any otherwise potentially clear test. But still, compared to where we are now, I think that would be a substantial improvement. All righty. Roy, um, the, the last word's going to go to you. Uh, what What should the court do, and what do you think the court will do? Uh, well, one thing I'd also note in terms of sort of this ping pong back and forth and the different administrations, Justice Rehnquist in, uh, in State Farm observed that it's perfectly reasonable basis uh, to, to change uh, a regulation based on uh, a presidential election. Uh, so that's just our that's our system of government uh, in terms of in terms of what I what I what the court should do. Uh, there's an ongoing rulemaking that in the old days, the notion of judicial economy or respect for the executive branch would allow the executive branch to finish the process, even though different administrations have different views. Um, if the court reaches the merits, what it should do is defer to the executive branch agency's technical expertise. Uh, what will the court do? I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but if they adopt the uh, the petitioner's proposed test, it's it's going to be open season on wetlands. And and as to, uh, in terms of your 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 proposed proposal for what the court should do, um, would in your view this new rulemaking retroactively determine whether the Sackets can develop their property, or or would they sim their ability to develop or not develop the property be dependent upon the validity of the uh, of the judgment made? By, by the agencies and the courts before. So at, at this point, I mean, let's let's say the court defers and the Biden administration comes out with a rule that actually says, hey, the Sackett's property is jurisdictional. That just means the Sackett's need to apply for a permit 
most permits are granted and most permits are granted through a general permit process. So it, it's not saying just because you're just because your property is jurisdictional doesn't mean that it's it's hands off. It means that you have to go through a permit process. All right, well, we're gonna have to leave it there. We are at the bottom of the hour. Um, uh, thank you both, uh, uh, Professor Gardner and Jonathan Wood for uh, spending this hour with us walking through the, uh, the, the issues in the Sackett case. Um, uh, Patty Harbold has put the um, CLE link and the activity code in the chat. I'm about to put up a slide uh, that has that information as well. So for those of you that want uh, the, the CLE, um, take down that information, um, complete the evaluation within 48 hours, um, and um, uh, you can get uh, uh, your CLE credit. Uh, this case, again, will be uh, argued on October 3rd. So I guess uh, we may get some indication uh, the first week of October about uh, whether either any of our predictions are accurate. Um, and after that, you know, maybe, maybe we'll know something more in December or January or, or perhaps next June. Uh, but thank, thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts. Uh, and we look forward to, to seeing you all in a future program. And there is the CLE information again for folks that are here for the CLE. Um, there is your CLE information. I will leave uh, the webinar open uh, for those that uh, need to to, to, to write down that information. It is also uh, the link for the CLE uh, and the activity code number is also uh, in uh, the chat.
All right, folks, I'm getting ready to just close this out. If you need the CLE information, again, the CLE activity code is 499729 um, to get the CLE credit for the program, complete the evaluation link uh, that's available in the chat box. The link should have also been in your registration confirmation. So send that in within 48 hours and your CLE stuff will be submitted. The CLE activity code is 499729. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can email Patty Harbold at Academic Centers, one word, but two C's there in the middle, Academic Centers at case.edu. Thank you very much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you at a future Burke Center program.